Okay. Yeah. So, all right. I think we can start the session. So uh, thank you so much, Zena, for joining. Um, we are hosting our 11th session of Let's Talk Public Health. Uh, this series was started with an initiative to just bring different public health experts, practitioners, researchers on board to just talk about the different, uh, you know, different problems in Pakistan and how we can like address them and uh, how we can collectively work together and maybe just reuse some of the research that we also have to help solve problems. So, and so far we've had like quite a few interesting discussions. We've had discussions on family planning. We've had discussions on community-centric approaches to uh, women empowerment. So, um, Yes, yeah, so there are just a couple of um, interesting sessions we've had so far. We've got a different couple of people who, who we've had on board. Uh, so Dr. Nan Khan from uh, Research and Development Solutions. We've got Dr. Aisha Nan from Aisha Khan, who is from the sister organization, a uh, Akhirmeet Khan Foundation. We had Dr. Ijaz Gilani as the first session also, who, who also talked about NCTs in Pakistan. And uh, so today we're just gonna be having more of a discussion on some of the research that we've done that Caliph has conducted over the last 30 to 40 years, and also data from our most recent survey, which uh, will touch upon nutrition and health in Pakistan. Uh, I do a little bit of my introduction and we can have an introduction from you to sign up. Um, so I'm Michelle Kiani. I am the manager for Caliph's public health program. And I work on a variety of initiatives under the ambit of the public health stream. And um, over to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am Zainab Khan, and I am working at Gallup Pakistan as a research executive. Um, I'm very excited to go over this report because having gone through it, I feel like nutrition and health is one of those topics that, you know, very silently just goes past our radar and doesn't really come into the conversation that often. But just looking at public perception about it, it's really interesting to see how it's shaped up over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I also particularly like about the fact, you know, the way that Gallup has done this is that um, normally when we think of nutrition, right, we're thinking of, so even when I first started working in nutrition, it was more about, you know, like malnutrition and uh, because malnutrition, of course, is a very like, uh, child malnutrition is a very big problem in Pakistan as well. So a lot of like grave issues which are of like deep concern. But this kind of, or the data that we have like from Gallup kind of like just looks at more daily habits of, you know, what an average Pakistani likes to eat and how they're going about their consumption, you know, choices. So, and that is just a lot of what, you know, that, that kind of data is very useful in terms of, you know, you can just, instead of just looking at issues, which I, which of course is very important from like a very deep analysis perspective, you're also just getting more of like, okay, day to day, you know, what am I eating? Um, how much salt am I taking? How much, how many cups of tea am I drinking? Um, and these are questions that we normally wouldn't cross anybody's mind. So like you mentioned also, um, you know, uh, we're not constantly thinking about how many, you know, cups of tea, tea that I'm drinking or how much salt I'm consuming. But um, I like the fact that we have this data, you know, from that perspective. And um, in this particular report, like we go over a couple of different areas. We look at meat consumption. Like I mentioned, we look at salt intake. We look at, um, you know, how many times a day you're having meat or how many times a day you're having a meat also. So um, those are just some, you know, like those are just some thoughts that I had, you know, with regards to the data. And um, I can start with just maybe going over some of the graphs that we had in the report. Like, for instance, we asked a question on, yeah. you know, what Pakistanis like to take for breakfast. And you can see, like, <laughs> I mean, immediately the first thing that comes to your mind when you look at this graph is, okay, they're consuming paratas, which is half, half of our respondents, you know, said that, okay, yeah. that's what we take. And that is like interesting, right? Because um, when you think about it like that, for at least for people who work in public health, that seems like a very bad choice. <laughs> that's 
that's like you know uh, okay that's not the most healthy choice you know for breakfast but but also then it, then you think about you know how uh, culturally influenced choices are as well because this obviously might not be the case in like other countries where um you know where where different cultures have different food preferences as well so i think that's also one thing that came to my mind is that um you know culturally we are we are a bit more this is something that's probably more ingrained in us where we're consuming things like paratas or um rotis or things like that um and this has also been fairly same over the years like it hasn't really changed that much if you look at the trend data you know it's 45% you know over like last 15 years and then 50% in 2022 which is our most recent data so um yeah so i think um that's one thing that maybe um as a researcher i would also like to go deeper into questions like this like for example like i said like the thing that comes to my mind is what's driving people to make you know consistently the same choice um like when we know that um obviously there's more awareness with like you know as you as times change or things like that there's more awareness with what you're consuming can be harmful to you right but in spite of that we still see that over the years people have consistently preferred this or this is the more popular choice so i'd like to maybe you know dig deeper into that and see um it's yeah, the same with definitely with um uh, especially if you're looking at just the paratha in breakfast um concept that is very prevalent in pakistan i think it also has to do with just you know like the joint family system that you do see in pakistan that's prevalent um where you know there's like mothers making food for their kids because i know that i would never make myself a paratha but if my mom makes me one i would devour it um so there's you know things like that as well just like like you said adding to the cultural aspect of it and also just um people you know there might be kinds of occupation where you might not expect to eat a lot during the day so you think okay you know we'll just um save up a lot of energy if we just have a big breakfast and again that also does add up into the cultural and also the occupational um layout of mm-hmm. our population and the country itself yeah yeah you're right about that right like the the dynamic where um where obviously like if if you're living in a family system right and somebody's making a meal for you um you're more likely to consume it in, in case where where it's the mother or like um any of the that figure in the household so i yeah i definitely do agree with that um where that all also but also like i said like there are a lot of these things are things where where we're not really thinking too much into it but i feel like as a researcher or as somebody who works in the field um obviously every choice you make has like repercussions so you i mean we we asked the basic question right like what are you eating for breakfast but not necessarily why are you eating it <laughs> so um, i i think that would be my yeah. next question is especially if you know or like related to also you know whether if you have say uh, an illness right especially in the case of somebody who's older right and they're still consuming say somebody's got um a heart problem or a heart disease or anything like that and um and you know the fat uh, you know component of like a paratha is of course or anything with like oily food is obviously higher so if you have high cholesterol levels are you still um consuming parathas or you know that's that's a question that i would ask as well and if yes how many and how frequently um because then again that moves more towards like the social and behavioral determinants of you know d- a disease and the risk factors for it as well so um, yeah that that's the yeah, that was something that i would also like to like maybe study more in like future um another uh, interesting question which we also had in this was uh, how many meals do people have a day and i think majority or close to it actually say about 50% say twice a day um but and and i saw like the the thing that i noticed here was that in 2009 to like over like a decade ago where people more than half were saying that they were having it thrice a day so um i i'd also like to see how this data was maybe collected or how the respondents like um the demographics like vary 
because it could also be that somebody who is in a relatively better financial position might be eating more meals and they could also be the people who might have responded early on but again i i don't know the details of like but that is also something that you know hmm. that could give us a more uh, like a better insight into why people were saying three times a day versus now they're saying two times a day and um, what that means or what that entails actually um one more thing so and this is this this question just tied into like the previous one so this this i actually found very very interesting where meat consumption so mm. i do think that the meat consumption choices have changed like yeah. where people are now you know consuming so they were consuming a lot more red meat before but it's not less now um at least in terms of beef and uh, chicken consumption is higher um you know as compared to about two decades ago as well so that is something that of course um so with chicken consumption especially in our country right like there's always uh, like at least in the case of women right because our country is like one of the highest incidences or rates of uh, pcos as well and we are actually discouraged from having chicken right where uh, and you're actually encouraged to have or consume red meat but um to see that these choices like change uh, over time where people are moving away from the consumption of like red meat i would also like to see why this is happening um hmm. i think there's more awareness i feel like uh, a lot more times where it, again it ties into your cholesterol levels as well where you know that you are obviously have high levels of cholesterol or something like that um you might make better health choices but again all everything i'm saying is based on an assumption so that but th- th- this uh, trend was actually one of the more interesting ones where i noticed that um, people were making slightly healthier choices moving away from different kinds of meats uh and moving towards the others and um for me i the thing that comes to mind is probably more awareness um maybe in terms of i mean it also depends on the you know the basically what section or subsection of the society you're from so and what you have access to right um i'm i do think if you're in a lower income household in general you don't have access to uh, red meat very frequently um i do think it's it's a bit of a luxury <laughs> item so um that could also just uh, because if i look at say the way pakistan is structured right where um, where a lot of people come to your household to like clean or how how we have health etc like that and if i interviewed say somebody from uh, somebody who's helped me out or something i they on on average what they're mostly consuming is uh, you know vegetables or lentils so that for that meat for them meat is definitely a luxury item eating like red meat is a luxury item so that's where i'm basing off my assumption from where uh, where i think in the low income households that might not be the case where people are consuming a lot of meat might be around the times of eid i guess but uh, not beyond that yeah um, i think definitely um i would probably factor in the price factor a lot more heavily than the awareness factor when it comes to eating beef or chicken because we do see that around the eat time like you mentioned the you know awareness all awareness for the harms of beef really do disappear when you have access to a lot of it so um i think price because for beef the um kind of inflation that we have currently i think it's also becoming inaccessible for the lower middle and um sort of middle class as well where they don't um access it as much as they would have preferred to they would rather have chicken and then you know spend that money somewhere else but then again these are you know like you said assumptions and it would be interesting mm-hmm. to see the reasons why people have moved away from beef um yeah, so like dying as your- they have Like here, we see how often is meat can eaten in your household, right? And it's twenty nine percent. But if you go back to, I mean, this is not much difference between thirty one and twenty nine percent. But I yeah. do, I understand why you're saying, uh, you know, inflation and adjusting for it as well. 
because the prices of meat obviously it's it's super expensive it is obviously considered a bit of a luxury item so um but yeah in spite of that like here you know so yeah people are consuming more white meat than red meat also so i guess chicken is also more affordable maybe <laughs> that's probably yeah. the yeah that's probably it um yes so yeah again this is a mix of all the different kinds of food items so this i was actually surprised with where i so you know we ask people uh, you know whether they prefer spicy food or they don't and it's actually surprising to see that the majority do prefer like an ideal combination of both because i did not think that would be the case because any time you do go out to eat as well uh, people are generally especially if you're eating you know a lot more desi food people generally prefer it on the spicier side so i was actually alarmed with this myself i was like okay that's that's actually a very decent response <laughs> or like a decent number of people that are saying okay no we'd like it to be you know somewhat spicy but like appropriately spiced and yeah, it's also interesting uh, that, to see that... the trend of um how the consumption mm-hmm. of spicier food or the preference for it has decreased by a lot and you know the preference for less spices has increased by a quite a significant amount over the years mm-hmm. yeah so yeah again like these are all like changes that obviously come with a lot of different advancements also so it could be um you know um because people are or they like for me the first thing that obviously that comes to mind with this is that you people also have like maybe slightly better awareness in terms of the access of like health care that yeah. that's available to them or even just in terms of you know like knowing that okay if, uh I mean, I'm not saying that it's improved like to the extent where healthcare access is improved to the extent that it's perfect, but it has improved over the years where people are able to get like care for if they are suffering from, you know, like an illness or at least in some of the more um, relatively privileged areas um, as compared to like um, underserved areas as well. So I think that also might be a factor why people sometimes uh, are could be making slightly better choices because when you have access to some kind of care you're also better informed so i just in general uh, you know that what you're doing might have a repercussion and that, or at least that's my reasoning when i think about it um is that uh, i might take more precautions because like uh because i've been informed because this writer has told me that if you you know like do this you this is going to happen so there's like a series of events that has to take for take place that for it to get to a point where you might need care so that's just one way of like thinking about it but of course um there's obviously a lot more that goes behind it as well um yeah i think in addition to um just healthcare access in general i do think that access to the internet has also brought about awareness in gaps where it was lacking previously um because now even though there might be a lot of misinformation but you do see you know tiktoks and youtube shorts and instagram reels um where like random people are sharing information and a lot of it might not be very uh well informed but there is some truth to it because if i i can see you know um my house self for example like looking at a tiktok and believing it to be true so if someone on tiktok is saying that you know spices are bad for you i can see them believing it um a lot more mm. so that's actually also like a, that's actually a very good point that you brought up um so i i always think like how how difficult it might be to get people to change behavior once they especially with the ease of access to information right like through tiktok so i, I how what would you say you know like also like you know younger people generally um are also very you know they're very very socially active so and they do buy into a lot of the things that are you know circulating over social media applications mm-hmm. so in terms of say you know we're talking about a behavioral change in terms of eating habits and say somebody is convinced that you know maybe eating 
beef every day is like a good thing because they saw it over like TikTok or anything. What would what would you do in that situation? Um, you know, how would yeah, you it's convince? It's definitely a double edged um sword <laughs> with all of this, but I think you you fight fire with fire in this regard. You know, you use. <laughs> Um, the same medium to convince those people because one blue tick can go a long way in convincing you know people of credibility so um, while mm. there might be a lot of misinformation if you can you know one credible source that people trust who is verified quote unquote on social media post something backed by numbers because I've also seen that people are very um, responsive to numbers you know if I say okay, you know x is this or if I say okay, 10 percent of the people say that x is this then the latter of my claims would be more likely I would believe um, to get a response or a reaction so I think numbers and just again like using the same medium to fight misinformation is what can be done because there aren't a lot of um, checks and balances on it as of yet especially in the context of Pakistan Mm-hmm. yeah that's that's actually a really good point yeah fighting fire with fire using the same medium so yeah I think it's just or like some sort of filter where people can kind of differentiate from where whether the information is real or fake so and I think one way of doing is obviously if somebody has a blue tick and is can is also maybe a specialist or something in the field uh, could also just use that platform to maybe uh, you know, provide more accurate information as opposed to somebody who's just there for, you know, the following. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's yeah. definitely one way to think about it. So this also was a good question. You know, do you buy fresh meat from the butcher shop or do you buy frozen meat? And 69% of people are saying that they prefer to buy fresh meat. And uh, I think the follow-up is also... Uh, that you know people some people believe it is not good to use frozen food and that's considered good and 59% say that it's like it's good frozen food but 69% are buying fresh food so that's that is also like um so with like fresh meat I I think this also is like dependent on a lot of factors where depending on how far it is located from you or in in the case of both so i think mobility might be a factor over here where we where it's easier for you to buy fresh meat or um, frozen meat frozen meat might actually be slightly more expensive if i'm not yeah uh, i think it's definitely more expensive so i do think because we have a larger population that's uh in a different income bracket or low income bracket, that also might be uh, one of the explanations why this is high. But in spite of that, it's a lot of people are saying, you know, that it's okay to use frozen food. So that's a bit of a conundrum. <laughs> so yeah, I um, think I don't... here it's 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 the the contradiction arises from fresh meat versus. Uh, frozen meat versus frozen foods in general because people are a lot more receptive to using products like for example KNMs or frozen um you know other things that they can fry up and serve to guests um if the case be but meat itself a lot of people okay. might not be very receptive to mm-hmm. so I think that yeah, might so- be one of the factors but again, like frozen, so access to things like, um, you know, say KNNs is also a privileged access, I think. Yeah, so, definitely. So I, I would also like to maybe go deeper into the data and see, you know, across like income levels, what might be the situation, you know, whether, you know, you're say from bracket X, where you're higher income level, are you still consuming fresh meat or are you having more frozen food? So that's also yeah. something that possibly we could. Ah, cups of tea. Uh, this is also <laughs> a good question. I think for, you know, everybody in Pakistan has chai, or I mean, at least the majority, the vast majority, which is like 92%. So, um, and also, so with tea, I think it's, I at least the trends that I'm noticing now are with tea, it's just, 
tea itself might not be the issue but i think it's the amount of sugar you might add to yeah. it which i from you know from a health perspective which might um be more harmful and i don't think a lot of people or this again is my assumption where people are not adding sugar so i do think a lot of people do add sugar to teas in pakistan so yeah. um and the and that shift that you see from because and like i've seen around you know like obviously if you go in different places again more well developed areas where you see the trends of like coffee shops have like picked up as well um and but I, i again that's probably not reflective of like the entire like pakistan of course where coffee is preferred over tea mm. so uh tea consumption is definitely still high uh again yeah see so you see here that 76% people say that they don't use coffee at home so <laughs> that's again i don't think yeah coffee is maybe a popular it's more of a western popularity yeah, thing I, right I, now true i would assume that um there are more coffee drinkers who are also tea drinkers than the other way around not everyone who drinks tea drinks coffee but you know i know a lot of people myself included who enjoy like a cup of coffee but then yeah. they also you know on a regular basis have their chai um so i yeah. think it's it's a lot more of the cultural phenomena as well where breakfasts aren't complete without a cup of tea and things like that so and the sugar yeah. part definitely you have all your like truck stop dhabas who have more sugar in their tea than tea itself um and it is really good but it might not be um very beneficial in the long run yeah i'm also thinking of how you know exactly say you work with people who are in the field who are practitioners or researchers you know how how this information could be helpful for them i mean if i know uh, maybe one way is obviously tracking it every year so if i know every year that somebody's having you know this many um, cups of tea um we you know what is the likelihood or probability of them in future or having this many you know teaspoons of sugar in tea what is the probability of them eventually like maybe getting diabetes so or if if any probability at all so that's that's i i think that's one thing that we kind of lack and i think gallup does a pretty good job in terms of you know like we've got data historically as well but we don't see that very often in like other places <clears throat> like i yeah. there's no way to like track you know things because data has always been there's always been a dearth of data in pakistan so but it it would be useful you know like if i'm a doctor even if I, for me to even know that information say you know somebody comes up to me and is you know has symptoms or is now you know on the type or be diabetes scale so uh, i like to like study it more I'd like to see especially as somebody who's more interested in the social and behavioral determinants of health so i'd like to see what you know what are the, what choices are they making and what has gotten them to this point but yeah i think the dearth of think- data has also- yeah go ahead um yeah definitely what you said about data is um I, i completely agree with that and also i think it would be a very interesting exercise to see how many people can be convinced that one teaspoon of sugar in their chai versus two teaspoons of sugar in their chai taste almost the same and you know whether um that exercise can actually convince people to decrease their sugar consumption in their chai um i think that is something that that would be very interesting that i would like to see sometime in the future perhaps yeah i mean doing all so doing like these behavioral interventions or just even you know just like a focus group uh, you know discussion where you could just first just get a sense of you know okay how many time or how many you know teaspoons of sugar do you take and then yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah versus you know if you were to offer them or even if you price it differently that might also be a factor right like you can there's a lot of ways to bring about like behavior change it's just it's just i don't think people have taken out the time to really you know dig deep over things like this but again yeah. as research like your research as well so this is something that you know researchers like to think about or do think about and 
can possibly do it in practice as well. You can start with your own office and see how, just see how many, you know, teaspoons of sugar everybody in the office takes. And like, that yeah, is yeah, like definitely. a... That is also just a good way to assess okay what is what do you think is the average that people might take um cups of tea again you know three or more that's a lot for one day <laughs> that's i mean 41 percent um that's a big percentage that are drinking three or more cups of tea and that ties into the same thing right like okay if they're having caffeine on its own that might not be such a huge thing but if it's you know with like heavy amounts of sugar what is what is what does that mean in future for them so mm -hmm. that's interesting as well salt consumption <clears throat> so um iodized salt beneficial or helpful so 40 percent say it's beneficial which is a decent percentage uh do we have iodized salt in the household so 34% actually say they use iodized salt daily. That's that's interesting. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Um, first, like in the previous trend data, you know, I'm alarmed to see the decrease in the amount of um people who think that it's beneficial for your health because it did decline by around 16% over the past few years. So um mm -hmm. that is one point where I'd like, you know, um be alarmed. But um there are people who use it daily, sure, but again, this is self-reported data. Um, so I would take mm -hmm. it, you know, take it with a grain of iodized salt. Um <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, but again, yeah, if it's true, if it's hundred percent accurate, if everyone who said they use it are using it, then that's a positive sign for sure. Um and I think the awareness generally has been increasing over time. Like in my household, if I see we did start using iodine salt pretty recently but um mm -hmm. there are changes that are coming around there are a lot of um so i also think that the um media has again obviously a huge role but especially um during the weekdays the morning mm -hmm. shows that come on that have a lot of um audience of you know homemaker women who have the time and you know who sit and watch these interact with these shows a lot of the things that these shows propagate um, do end up making up some part of the lifestyle of uh, the women who do watch it. So I know that my mom saw, you know, one morning show host talk about the benefits of iodized salt in her show. And she was like, okay, we could try it out. So um, yeah. almost everyone has televisions in their houses. And I do feel like morning show hosts do have some responsibility to inform their audiences of things like these. Because they should and probably are aware that their audiences are, you know, largely women who do have a larger say in what is cooked in the house, generally if we're speaking in um, terms of the Pakistani household dynamics. So that is something mm -hmm. that can be looked at, you know, the impact that they have or what they what they propagate or say has. Mm. With salt also, it's a bit tricky, right? Because it's just, it's not just, you know, like, okay, I'm, say I'm cooking, you know, a chicken curry or something i'm adding say two teaspoons salt to that but then i'm making roti and i'm adding salt to that as well so i yeah. wouldn't know so and so it's not just you know okay like it's, it's also a bit hard to measure that's what i mean to say is that it, because everything almost everything that you make mm. even when you dessert you add salt to that so yeah. that's like salt consumption like happening throughout the day um so uh, that's one thing that i would also be concerned about you know say we were want to measure this you know because obviously salt is one of the leading you know causes of like say hypertension so or at least taking increased levels of it so i would in terms of measurement how would i you know like measure that i i want to know how many teaspoons of salt somebody's taking on average but I wouldn't be able to tell that you know because they're using it in like multiple times a day so yeah. that's yeah. that is thing in terms of measurement that I would probably also just like think about I mean, you know, it could I be think an alternative like, um for that would be asking you know how many things in their household do they use salt in because from there it's easier to assume how much of the salt is being used 
Um, so I think mm -hmm. that is an avenue that could probably be explored. Yeah. So I think the next question was on oil versus key. Um, I mean, to be honest, I think both are bad, <laughs> but like key is not, you know, I don't know why people, I honestly have heard a lot of people in Pakistan think that key is better. I don't, I don't know if there's like a nutritional value that's higher for ghee, but, uh, but, you know, even with oil, it depends on the oil that you're using. Yeah. I mean, if I don't, I don't think olive oil is a very popular concept, you know, uh, which is obviously a little more on the healthier side. But people are just using like regular daldas or canodas or yeah. um, which I, I don't know what the, the nutritional or, you know, the health repercussions of using it because we do use a lot of oil in our food. Um, that's, I think, one of, I mean, all our food has like ranging from all our different, you know, karais and everything all our food has a lot of oil and if you look at other like countries i don't think um or food from like other countries i don't think oil is used in the capacity that it is in pakistan because people do prefer or tend to have things that are grilled which also the way you cook something like obviously makes a difference right like if you're grilling something you're not going to use a lot of oil but if you're going to make a kadai you're obviously going to use like quite a decent a amount lot. of it yeah so that so I think that also is maybe a bit of a cultural um influence where or the way just the way in which our food is made is like different and I and also I think quite unhealthy. So that's also one other uh, um very yeah, but... alarming thing that I came um that I saw recently uh, was that a lot of people you know how um in households oil is recycled so you cook something in um, a pan of oil mm -hmm. and you keep it and you cook something in it again because obviously the price is increasing also I mean that you do not you, uh, you don't want to waste oil and since we use a lot of oil mm -hmm. as well um, and I recently read that that I'm not sure of um, how credible or how um, reviewed the study is but there was something that said that you know that could lead to very serious health concerns as well like reusing and refrying the same oil and that is a practice that does happen a lot in Pakistani households and couple that with the amount of oil that we use and it does paint a pretty scary picture. Um, yeah. yeah, the reusing thing is a pretty, I think I've noticed that in my own household also yeah. where, uh, where, you know, you leave it there and you just fry something else. So, and I think, and I'm assuming that people obviously are not aware of like the study obviously the study that you've mentioned and also just in general so like, yeah these are all things that like I said like what the, this like particular study or this particular data is interesting because while it might seem like we're asking questions that are you know pretty basic like oh you know what are you eating how many cups of tea are you drinking uh, you know do you use oil or key but they all have like a very you know larger the, I mean in the larger context they all have like a very deep you know impact right like or can potentially have like a impact so that's so I think yeah that's why I found you know like this entire like exercise pretty like fascinating as well I think this was one of the last questions we had yes which was um, you know whether people agree or disagree with some of the statements that we asked them so the question, one of the statements was whenever I buy a packaged food item for the first time, I always read the ingredients on the box. 63% said that's true. That's that's a bit hard to believe. Yeah. Because that, it, more often than not, I I mean, even when I'm going for groceries or when I've been buying groceries, I don't think, I already know what I want to buy, right? So say I just like, I made a list and I'm just going there and I'm picking it yeah. out. And I and I do think that's that may that might be like it's a bit of a generalization, but that might be the trend where people already have made a list and they're so unless you're like somebody who's like particularly health conscious, I, I don't think this this data is like very indicative of what could be the the case. Um, then I don't consider it necessary to make healthy foods as a part of my diet. 61% saying that's false. This, I mean, this seems slightly okay because we do see like over the trends that we've just like discussed like where there are some like positive changes right like where people are 
moving towards like less consumption of like say red yeah. meat this i can this i think when like personally i feel like i could buy into this like statistic more the next one was i often decide on a brand for anything through advertisements this also yeah it, it's i don't think everybody it it really depends because some of our advertisements are quite um they are actually quite striking you know so i i feel like i wouldn't be surprised if people are also just basing their decisions off of like advertisements because if you go down because we also like the way the frequency with which we play our advertisements on tv is like mm. very high so i do think that might have like some behavioral component to it where you can like maybe influence somebody's decision to the extent where they might you know go and buy something because they saw it on tv uh the last one was i use uh, or i feel that frozen food is just as good as fresh food and 78% do not agree with that i mean we just went over that i think yeah it, this is also like a uh, varying i mean frozen food is not yeah this makes sense like of course unless yeah. your uh, frozen food could also it's not only limited to just but even if i think about it in the con- context of like reheating food right like reheating frozen food it just doesn't taste as good as when it's made fresh yeah. so it's also a component to it um and then if i think about you know say knns or things like that uh, again it's not the same as like fresh food so again this is also i think more believable statistic as well <laughs> but i think yeah so this was this i think brings us to the end of our graphical um discussion but um yeah so we've had like you know quite a few questions where we get some really interesting insights into you know how pakistanis are you know making their consumption choices um, food consumption choices at least and this like i would like tie into also you know um maybe how they're making choices regarding say physical like health uh, in terms mm-hmm. of like getting physical activity and then it, the, just correlating that data like might obviously gives us a better picture which is what we also attempt to do through our larger report right like where we've got data, not just data on you know this new nutrition but we have data on like you know whether somebody's you know exercising every day mm-hmm. if they're exercising at all if there's any kind of like physical activity involved which and that so when you bring all of that together obviously you have like a better um you know better idea of uh, you know whether people are now or now have healthier lifestyles say compared to like two or three decades ago and um and what that means for like the burden of disease is also a good question because uh if you if you bring all that data and we see it from like 30 years ago and then we you know kind of see it against okay, the incidence or the prevalence of say diabetes was high or uh, hypertension or things like that and versus now um that might that's actually the compar- the kind of comparison that i would want to like look into because i like, recently also i just read like a report where we have you know one of the highest incidences of diabetes um yeah. so that is very alarming um and and that's where i would say you know like yeah, i would like to look into more lifestyle factors as well like things like okay um how much are you working per day or how much sleep do you get at night um what is your mental health like you know do you go to the gym or things like that so just looking at more lifestyle factors um i think those are my overall thoughts what would do you have anything else that you would want to um yeah this last question is actually very interesting because it draws a very nice comparison between what people say and what people do um because you know like if you ask me are you do you make healthy choices i am more likely to say yes but then if you ask me what my choices are they might not be as healthy as i claim them to be so um, yeah. and also i i do feel like there is some burden of responsibility on you know grocery shops and these super stores because i i have noticed that it's harder to find healthier alternatives when you go to shop uh, you know you always have to ask hey you know where is so and so product from so and so company which is healthier than what you have on display so i feel like just displaying the healthier options 
upfront or at eye level, you know, very classic nudge theory, behavioral science. Um, but just, you know, mm. maybe small things, you know, these are little steps that can be taken and seen if, you know, they make any impact or not, because um, we do have a long way to go, like you said, and it ties into a lot of other factors as well. But maybe this is something that could be explored, um, whether, you know, just easier access to healthier alternatives makes people use them more or not. And then if not, then, you know, what else can be done to explore that? Yeah, you actually raised a very good point, you know, with like say if you take nudge three into account. So I so b- b- grocery stores themselves, like because I feel like they're more like uh, you know, it's all about consumerism and capitalism, you know, making money for, you know, obviously corporations like grocery stores. But I think the what what's important here or the role of somebody who's important here is probably, you know, say in Punjab we have a Punjab food authority, right? Yeah. Like it is it's probably up to one of those authorities to maybe take on that initiative where you you know can go up to grocery stores and tell them to arrange items in a way so i that's where i feel like yeah that multi you know stakeholder collaboration is like very important um especially if you want to get people to change behaviors because uh, you know corporations alone they're not always thinking about yeah. things like um, we want people to be healthy or they just want to make money so like they're just trying to sell I mean you'd often see things in clearance in like stores like Alphata that have like yeah. crossed their expiration date and it's been a while so you know like they've already crossed their expiration and they're still there on display so if that's what we are still faced with um, there's uh, you know like yeah the, the role of like bringing that multi-stakeholder collaboration together is probably a lot more important um do you have any parting thoughts uh, or any last two cents that you would want to do um yeah it's just it's been a very interesting exercise because like you mentioned when i went through the questions you know individually i didn't really know what kind of insights we could derive from them but just this this discussion in itself has proved very fruitful because one thing does lead to another and just looking at all of these questions and this report in tandem really does paint somewhat of a picture of where we stand and where we might want to get to uh, maybe 10 years from now in the next trend analysis who knows yeah that's yeah that's basically what was the point of this as well i think this exercise was good for both of us um not just like going or just like making the data you know graphical representation but also just like dip, digging deep into um you know what that data can mean or what it can mean for us as you know